The Principle of Hope by Ernst Bloch, Volume 1, Chapter 11. Man has a, quiet, has a quite extensive complex of drives. The individual body. The drive must have someone behind it. But who is the searcher open to stimuli? Who moves in the living movement? Who drives in the animal? Who wishes in man? Everything certainly does not revolve around the ego here, because a drive overcomes us. This does not mean, however, that no individual self-enclosed being is, is present at all, which carries and feels the drives and takes away unpleasant feelings by satisfying them. But this being is first and foremost the living individual body, moved by stimuli, overcrowded with stimuli. It contains the drives. They are not floating generally. And when the animal eats, its own body is satisfied, nothing else. <clears throat> no drive without body behind it. Certainly that which feels itself to be body is itself very general. It merely finds itself in a good or bad state of health. But these are not very clear findings. Whereas every drive certainly seems to appear as a who and as if it were pulling the body behind it as if the body did not contain the drive, but the drive contained the body and determined it, dyed it respectively, black with rage, green with envy, red with anger, like a piece of cloth. In addition, there is also the long duration and apparently subjectless appearance which the drives possess in so-called instinct. The chicks which have just crawled out of the egg peck immediately for grains of corn, on a predetermined path in which they attain what is their own in the most effective manner. The path is steered by the cerebellum, though subsequently, of course, according to Pavlov's discoveries, it can be steered in changing directions by the cerebral cortex and the environment which is experienced through the latter as changed, particularly among the higher animals. But so-called instincts or so-called instinct works falsely as if it were a self-guiding drive. And people experience it too, particularly women, if not in love, then as caring mothers. Here it really does appear as if drives existed independently and controlled the body, not to mention the soul. But even less efficient drives occasionally pretend to be independent, make people into their prey. This is so in the case of neurotics, where an isolated drive direction which appears almost self-sufficient overwhelms not only the body but also the conscious ego and confronts it as something alien. This is also true in healthy people at the moment when they are overpowered by a drive feeling, as if the emotion were a master in itself. Then we may say, it was not the lovesick girl who went into the water out of grief, but the grief which went into the water with the lovesick girl. But nevertheless, despite this in many ways subjectless appearance, nothing in the body allows drives to become their own vehicles. When the bird builds its nest, <clears throat> when the swallow finds the previous year's nest, there is still, of course, no ego at work in, much, in such mysterious processes, but also no independent drive which could, as it were, get by without a body. Even the drive instinct belongs to the economy of the individual body and is only employed insofar as it belongs to it, insofar as the body does its own business, fleeing from what damages it, searching for what preserves it. This is why there are also several motivating forces, according to the circumstances, not only a single one that drives everything along. Present throughout is only the body which wants to preserve itself, and therefore eats, drinks, makes love, overwhelms, and thus drives alone in its drives, however varied they may be and however transformed by the appearing ego and its relationships. The changing passion. Man, in particular, always carries several drives with him, for he retains not only most of the animal ones, he also produces new ones. That is, not only his body, but also his ego is emotional. Conscious man is the most difficult of all animals to satisfy. He is, in the gratification of his wishes, the animal which makes detours. If he lacks what is necessary for life, he feels the lack like no other creature. 
hunger visions surface. If he has what is necessary, then then with its enjoyment, new desires surface, which torment him differently, but no less intensely than the previous naked privation. The rich and the sated, but not only them, possibly suffer from the strange itch of the I don't know what it is. Luxury above all, which does appear to fulfill everything, is an insatiable driver. Xerxes offered a prize for uh, the invention of a new pleasure. Not only boredom was behind this, but an unknown drive, at least the clamor for it, which also wanted to be stilled. In fact, in the course of history, with its changing forms, the increasing extent to which needs are satisfied, hardly one kind of drive has remained the same, and not one presents itself as finished. With the new objects, differently orientated addictions and passions awake, of which nobody had the slightest inkling yesterday. The acquisitive drive, for example, which is itself only acquired anyway, has grown to an extent which was quite alien to pre-capitalist times. Even the sexual libido is in many ways thwarted by it. Rather new also is the record drive in late capitalist society, especially the empty technological addiction to ever greater speed. This latter addiction was first created by motorized vehicles. Above all, however, monopoly capitalism needs to intensify an abstract record drive for the purpose of whipping people on, for otherwise the maximum profit could not be so quickly squeezed from the workers. And furthermore, the fascist death drive has a novelty which is almost furious, compared to, say, the sentimental death drive of the Werthertzeit, or even the romantic nocturnal kind. It is fired and orientated by a very different social mandate. It receives a bonus partly for the slaughter and imperialist war, partly for the pointlessness of late bourgeois existence as a whole. On the other hand, the religious drive, if one can call this phenomenon such, heavily laden as it is with superstructure, the drive upward, the erotic urge towards the changeless, receded. And where it, <clears throat> and where it was stimulated in a depraved or deceived way, as in various fascist seductions, the previous upward drive hardly remained one. It sank into the soil, into blood and soil. In short, we realize that man is an equally changeable and extensive complex of drives, a heap of changing and mostly badly ordered wishes, and a permanent motivating force, a single basic drive insofar as it does not become independent and thus hang in the air is hardly conceivable. The principal motivating force does not even become visible in men of the same time and class by psychoanalytically dismantling their apparently purely inner clockwork, for example. There are certainly several basic drives. Now one, now another emerges more strongly. Now they work together like opposing winds around a ship, and they do not even remain similar to themselves. Man wants to make his fortune. This saying certainly does sound really old, and it is also undoubtedly reliable in quite a different way from the calumny about the eternal predatory drive. But when we ask, which fortune and for what, then immediately the questions and refinements always begin. It would also be too remarkable if in, it would also be too remarkable if in class history where new imagined goals of striving repeatedly surfaced, the goal-directed striving of the drives in fact proceeded in one direction, firmly already complete.